This is Ham Radio Now, still the most important amateur radio program on the internet. I mean, I just looked. No competition so far. And this is episode 373, Improving the Citizen Weather Observer Program. And we're still back at the uh, ARRL and Tapper Digital Communications Conference 2017 edition uh, from last September in St. Louis. And uh, and still Jerry Krager and 5JXS uh, doing the presentation. Um, in episode 272, 372, we learned about the Citizen Weather Observer Program. If you've got one of those weather stations that you see at the Hamfest and stuff, you may have known all about it. You may have registered. You may know that your data is actually being used by NOAA in uh, figuring out what's going on in the weather out there. Jerry's going to explain all about that, but it, it boils down to two things. One is that they could use more and better data. And two is actually a kind of a tapper project that they're ginning up sort of on the fly at this uh, part of the Sunday seminar. And that is lightning strike reporting from ham radio operators and maybe other people involved in the uh, CWOP. So um, that could be interesting. Maybe you'll be able to take part. Uh, ham Radio Now is brought to you by you. Stop by and see Arvind, the hamradionow.tv website. Help us out. We didn't do a Kickstarter for this program or for this uh, for this series, so your contributions are uh, covering all the costs, paying me a little bit. Um, and now let's head back to St. Louis and uh, pick up uh, part two of the Sunday seminar. More and better. So let's let's kick off the second half. So get your your engineering notebooks out and put your thinking caps on because we're going to be designing a weather station. The first part of this is actually going to be, do we want to change the protocol we're using to send the data? And this is a request for information. I'm looking for feedback and potentially some people to help do this. Now, if you think about it, the protocol is old. The protocol did not have the benefit of knowing how meteorology really needed to see the data in terms of precision, especially. So it'd be nice if we could improve that a little bit, but we've been using it for so long that does, it may not completely matter. So this, this is a, I got a gaggle of geeks. Geeks always have ideas about this sort of thing. Some of them even agree. They may agree, you, you may agree with what I'm thinking, you may not. At this point, I'm turning my opinions off. I'm going to present what I've got here on the slides, and, see, and this is an, should be an even more lively session because I'm looking for the feedback. So if we go back to about oh, 2001, we have the formation of the, uh, of the APRS spec. And as I said, neither meteorologists nor metrologists were actually involved in that. Because, because it was designed to uh, meet the requirements for APRS. And nobody ever thought that anybody would be using this weather data for something serious. Because it was two years later before Russ decided to use it for something serious. Now, we could always put better defined information, more precise information in the remarks section. But we're sort of using that up already. And that's codified into telling us what the weather station is. Precision isn't consistent with what NOAA and WMO want to see. We've got, you know, like I said, we've got rules about that sort of thing. Like a tenth of a degree, a uh, tenth of a millibar, 1% humidity, well, we meet that. Uh, tenth of a degree dew point, wind velocities at, uh, and wind directions to uh, single units, and in some cases, uh, 0.5 or 0.1. So there, there, there are specs that we could go to and, and enhance that. But we don't have the significant digits to play with right now in, uh, in the spec. The metadata entry is difficult, and it's, uh, the entry itself is, is hard, and updates are also difficult. And they're poorly tracked. We need to do a better job of that. So I'm trying to think in terms of things we might, if we are going to rewrite how we send the data, could we do it better? And could we actually enhance the data, the, the metadata that we're getting as well? Metadata is rarely updated. Why? Because it's difficult. If it's hard, 
and I tell you I really want your metadata, are you going to want to do something that's hard? No, nah, I didn't think so. So is it time to consider a change? John, you want to reconvene that group? Yeah. My, my first question is, is a very practical matter is, is two things. One is, who are the current APRS developers? Because I don't, I don't even know, and will they participate? And second is, how are you going to deal with backward compatibility with the existing base? I think if, if you can address those two questions, then you can start looking substantively at what, what you can do. But without the developers participating, you know, you're not going to get very far. And I really don't want to go to another one of those locked rooms, but if we have to. <laughs> I don't want to go to BWE. <laughs> we'll find someplace even less pleasant. Cool. So um, I think that Tapper did very well because Tapper actually created both the hardware and the software first. And that they then made a standard once they actually had something to run it on and that they could demonstrate its operation. And I remember having convened a group to replace AX.25 in the late 80s. And uh, this is, you know, because obviously it was at that time at least 20 year old. And um, that was mistake. And the reason it was a mistake was that I was starting with the paper and sort of implicitly asking permission from a very wide range of people before anyone would actually do the technical work. And um, as things like open source have happened, it's become even more clear. First, do not ask permission. Um, and second, have a working technical system demonstrated and installed by other people who are not you before you attempt to standardize it. And at that time, you can get people who say, well, gee, this is great, but I, I need 50,000 feet height because I want to do it with, uh, you know, special U2s or something. And, and then they can get the fields in that they want. Um, but at this point, because the barrier for creation of the actual system that would fit the standard is so low. Anybody with a laptop and free software can make this. Um, you start with that first and you standardize afterwards. So next year, we'd like to see it at the Tapper Conference in New Mexico. Thank you. Is that a challenge? <laughs> well, and I want to bookend on Bruce having done work in industry with wireless as well. And I believe there's another gentleman here that's involved with um, I, uh, the engineering task force and the IEEE. But let's keep it simple. I agree with Bruce. Let's just do it and don't worry about asking permission. And I'm sure John's going to have a retort. Well, I, I, I'm not about asking permission, uh, but I, I want to understand the scope of what we're doing. I think what you're describing is redefining the payload in, a, in, a, in APRS. Uh, so it's not a new oh, from scratch protocol or hardware. And, my, and that's my concern about interoperability is we're looking at launching a new packet type within an existing system. Um, or, is, or am I wrong about that conception? Okay, so what I'm going to be talking about, to jump ahead a dozen slides or so, or maybe not that many, is adopting a standard, an internationally recognized standard, that is unfortunately XML. That's the downside. XML is by nature chatty. It's longer than we want. Could we encrypt that or encode that and make it smaller? Yeah. And the answer is yes, because the industry responded to that XML, mm -hmm. and it's called JSON. 
Yes. And it's called MQTT. And yes, in fact, we can go that path. But I didn't intend to bias this by saying, this is the way I want to go. That's why I've got you guys here, is I want ideas to make sure I'm not absolutely nuts. Then the way we start is not so much let the, the tail wag the dog, okay? First of all, you're the expert. You let us know what information you need and why, and then let the technical people take over after that. Yes. Yeah, oh, I can write specs. Uh, okay, yes. Uh, just in the interest purely brainstorming, it seems to me we could parse this uh, on one axis real easily, and that's the metadata versus any type of discussion of a new protocol packet structure for the existing data types. It seems to me that if we introduced a new packet standard, whatever it might be, that covers the metadata needs, that could be completely separate from the discussion of, of more granular, more higher resolution, you know, extending the current weather packet. It, it just seems to me those are two, could be two completely separate discussions, they, and we could affect the one immediately. We, we can actually affect all of them, I believe, and we have another question back here. Yeah, I... I wanted to uh, uh, bring up the, the issue of what do we need in terms of uh, accuracy and uh, reliability of the data, and what are the hardware platforms, in other words, the weather stations capable of doing. I think those issues also define what the software, which is what we were discussing, uh, uh, needs to be, in other words, how many positions of accuracy, and and also uh, uh, not only is it the displayed accuracy, but how close to reality does that accuracy represent? Oh, uh, that's the, oh that <coughs> there was a very interesting board called the Micro WX that was designed and built by a professor out of Iowa. I love the board. I love the concept. It looked like a Pete Brothers weather station on the output. But for reasons I don't completely understand, he, he went with the lower precision parts. And it, actually, I do, uh, because he and I talked about it. Part of the reason was the protocol for APRS didn't support the increased precision that the meteorological community wanted. And it's like, oh, well, then I'll use the ones that are 70 cents cheaper. Okay. If I plug the other ones in, I still had the PEAT protocol, so the microcontroller had to be reprogrammed. But that's an easy fix. The answer is the biggest things we're missing right now in this are the ability to report other sensors, like insulation, soil temperature, soil moisture, uh, leaf wetness, uh, flux in uh, temperature flux, uh, 3D winds. These are the things we routinely see. Oh, present weather, uh, visibility, ceiling. Yeah, you know, why why can't we be reporting everything? reliably that an ASOS station reports and potentially a few other things, be able to extend the sensors that, to something that we haven't invented, something we haven't thought of, something that no ham has ever installed before. Uh, I don't know, e even, the, even the system that Evan Bookbinder put in doesn't have a solometer in place, but I've got a solometer. Yes? Just leaving fields for the, f leaving fields for the future uh, expansion in the standard, and uh, it's, you can, you know, if you leave enough fields, you've got it till the next standard's needed. But uh, on the other hand, if you use a 
uh, technique of encapsulating the data like XML, you can artificially extend it. And then if the receiving end knows how to process it, it does. If it doesn't, it just ignores it. Or And the other thing is, are we forcing you to like um, go ahead a few slides? Are we? Uh, uh, this is the type are, of thing are, I are, wanted are, to are, get. Are, are we seeing ahead to what some I'm, of the things I'm you're going to I'm get to some of this, but it, John, just to bring up painful wounds, uh, you know, we don't just have to revise weather if we do a 2.0 spec. We could also talk about how high altitude balloons, some of the specifics associated with them. Aircraft, there are a lot of people with APRS and airplanes now. I don't know if they've gotten Form 337s for their hardware or not. That's an interesting question. Manned balloons. Do you know what I would have given to have something a little more specific to uh, altitude in my cows? How many of you guys have heard of cows in space? I know you have. Once upon a time, I put APRS trackers on cows. I also had a differential correction station on the, on the ranch and was able, I, I told you earlier, I was able to achieve sub-bovine accuracy. We were down well below a half meter accuracy on the location of these cows, which became very significant in two cases. One allowed us to find the hole in the fence where one had decided to exit the property and go into town for dinner. So not only were we able to recover her, but we were also able to fix the fence. And the other one was where we were able to find the, the heifer and her first calf after she calved because she was laying down in the same spot with the, uh, with the uh, belt still on. And if you know, heifer, you don't want to lose the animal, you don't want to lose the calf. So as soon as we saw somebody there for about an hour and not moving, it's like, you know, maybe we ought to go check on this. And we did, and everything was fine, but that was significant from the rancher's standpoint. But being able to get the increased location information in there, the high accuracy location information in there would have been nice. As it was, we had to go wander around about a 30-meter area with a bunch of mesquite trees, and that can be uncomfortable. Oh, and rattlesnakes. So yeah, would, it, would it be possible if we, if we reconvened the committee to update other things. Are there other things that we need to do? That's just, but what about other specs? It's just an interesting question. I don't even know right now who that community is. Yeah, and. Well, I want to emphasize, l let's separate the protocol, the parsing, the formatting from the data, okay? Don't allow the ta the w the tail to wag the dog. You know, yeah. uh, I I worked with engineers long enough, professionally and voluntarily, that there's this the the, the mind is working a thousand clicks a second. Okay, and everybody wants to jump to the answer. And I facilitate a lot of discussions where we have to put a fence around it. We have to say, look, the discussion for the moment is just the data, just what this widget is to do. What is the customer experience? What, what are we trying to achieve and have absolutely zero discussion of the technology? It's okay. very, very hard for engineers to do, but we have to do it that way. The data and the technology have to be separated, and we have to start the discussion with what is it the meteorologists need, you're the experts, what is the data, how do you want to deal with it? Make sure the engineers know what you want to do with it. And, and that's where, where I'm going with, we want increased precision, and I can't deal with the increased accuracy because these are all consumer grade, or mostly consumer grade weather stations. I can't improve their accuracy, but I can improve the, the precision that they report. And I will accept that because I believe in the long term, the consumer grade manufacturers, when they see that increased precision is being reported, will improve the precision of the instruments. Once they fi figure this out, I'm, I'm reasonably certain Davis will, 
The instrument I use from Weisla is already a professional grade instrument, so it can already report that stuff out. Not a big deal. But the precision is a problem. Uh, the barometric uh, pressure for us to one millibar is not accurate enough. Oh yeah, uh, it, it, part of that's a perception and operations problem. We've trained all of our meteorologists to go to the tenth or even the hundredth of a millibar, and in some cases, in some very unique cases, looking at something, some, some sort of a severe weather phenomenon that can be significant. But for the most part, you walk outside, you look at what we've got going on here today, we're not going to see severe weather here today, eh, who cares? I'll take 1,013. Not 1,013.01, 1,013 is close enough for me for today outside. But there are instances where we're looking at the collapse of a thunderstorm in central Oklahoma that leads to the initiation of a thunderstorm in Gerald, Texas that devastates the town. And the only way we got that was by looking at fine changes in barometric pressure. So yeah, the precision can be important. And the accuracy of the instrument can be important. But that, that's a very real case. That's not a hypothetical case that, uh, of the collapse of a storm creating what amounted to gravity waves. And the gravity wave initiated, provided the lift in the storm in central Texas that, require, that was required for the convection and allowed it to take off. Yes? So the initial design, it's a chicken and egg problem. Always has been. And and if you allow space in the reporting, there'll be competition in the equipment manufacturers to be able to tout the, you know, uh, more colors or dots per inch or whatever uh, their spec is to, you know, at, at the time they didn't have to go faster, better, cheaper because the, uh, the reporting wasn't there to do it. But the next generation weather station, if they see that the capability to report it out might grow. might grow, and that's what I would hope for, that, uh, that we see an incremental change. We're not going to change this overnight. We're going to have people continue reporting overnight, and the way my mind has been going, it has been, let's not abandon the existing protocol, let's augment it with a different option, at least to start with, and down the road we go there. So anybody familiar with the Open Geospatial Consortium? Ooh, cool. I sat on the technical committee for over 10 years, mostly on geodesy, but I was also involved in sensor ML and the oceans ML, uh, la markup languages for that. Sensor ML was designed primarily for satellites, overhead imagery. It's now being used in sensors of all sorts and flavors. I was the first one who talked to Mike Botts and said, Ooh, weather station. And he goes, no, satellite. Weather station, Mike. No, satellite. We don't have any of the, anything in the schema for weather stations. I'll fix that. So I wrote the original extensions for sensor ML for weather stations. That was the most painful day of my life <laughs> because it took a lot more coffee than I had available to write that much XML. Now there's a subset of sensor ML called starfish fungus language. If any of you have ever met Ingo Simonis, you would understand why it's named starfish fungus language. It's completely representative of absolutely nothing he was doing at the time. He saw something online that triggered it. He was probably listening to bad music. And, ooh, this is a cool name. I think that's what I'll call it. But. He was a freshly minted, you're going to like this, Nathaniel. He was a freshly minted research professor at the time in Austria. Absolutely brilliant. He's still teaching, he's still doing research in, the, in that community. And he also, oh, by the way, has a major uh, GIS firm in, uh, in Europe now called 42 North. Um, he came up with the starfish fungus language original concept 
This thing is chatty. It's XML. You can't make XML quiet until you start doing something, as you pointed, like JSON. Or in this case, because this is all G, uh, related in some form to a geospatial environment, GeoJSON. And you know, what we're doing is also GIS-based. I've encoded, I've done demonstrations of APRS in uh, a variety of the Open G, uh, Geospatial Consortium formats for uh, uh, web coverage service and uh, web map service, just representing and rapidly updating the uh, locations of stations. They thought it was cool. They didn't know anybody. You know, they, they had an entire working group on how to track vehicles, and they didn't know somebody was already doing this. So there's a, a little bit of tunnel vision in almost every group. There are recognized schemas. The stuff is extensible. It's XML. You can't stop it from being extensible. You can define your units and precision arbitrarily within the, uh, within the schema as you write it. And it's a, it is a recognized international standard. About 10 years ago, OGC stopped going to ISO and asking them to create their standards and sought to become an international standardize, uh, standardizing organization, a standards body, and were accepted. In fact, NOAA has a preference for uh, Star FL, and that's because they have a national mesonet program that was uh, seeded out to one of the uh, private sector uh, vendors, and they did a careful analysis. They also have a seat now on the OGC Technical Committee, and they picked Star FL. Star FL officially is not an OGC standard. Sensor ML is the OGC standard, but everything in Star FL is a derivation from Sensor ML, so it's not a bad way necessarily to go. So we've got some of the models here. You talk about things like the sensor characteristic, which goes to the sensor procedure, and it's implemented by the characteristic component, uh, and then you uh, come down here to based on another sensing procedure, which may be based on other sensing procedures. It depends on how you do it. You can take, for instance, I have a broad spectrum, gosh, let's look at satellites. I have a broad spectrum imaging system on a satellite looking down, and it captures data at a variety of wavelengths in different segments. And from these different segments, I can tell you what the uh, water vapor component is. I can tell you what the, the wind velocity is, but these are all derived from some of the different sensor measurements. Infrared temperature of the, cloud, of the clouds. I can even determine pressure in some cases by looking at uh, derivations of different sensor, uh, of, of different wavelength information. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. So this, this is the basic static model for uh, uh, for star FL for a sensor component. And, well, we can look at something like this. What do we have here? We have temperature, wind direction, wind chill, which is a derivation based on wind speed and temperature. We have wind speed. This is from a particular instrument made by Vaisala. That's just because that's the one I wrote it for once upon a time. It was the one I had handy sitting, at, you know, sitting on, uh, my, at my house, pulling data in. So we've got a wind cup, which is the physical sensor. Overall, the station is the WXT520. And then we have that, uh, call it a thermo cup. I've never seen that. It's actually a wind cap. And then uh, PTD is what they call this, because temperature, pressure, and uh, humidity uh, or dew point are all measured in a single uh, strip of, it, of hardware that was originally designed for a radius sonde. But they've tuned this one to be able to survive for two year uh, increments and be replaced every two years. Doesn't require calibration, it's a cute thing. This is an eye chart. So you've got measurement capability, Sensing procedure, th this is bas basically how you get to your measurement capabilities. And you've got accuracy, direction unit, skill, 
extension, uh, frequency, latency, precision, range. You, you have a whole variety of the measurement capabilities that are built into any given good measurement. And with that, you uh, have, the, have much of the metadata associated with a given instrument or a given sensor at that point. I'm sorry, another eye chart. But this is the dynamic model. And it's even in worse focus. You have sensing going to a sensor. Uh, calibration, calibration range, the actual deployment, uh, pulse output. You've got, th this is the model of the dynamic sensing environment for an entire instrument. And you represent all of this in different XML uh, as, a, as a single large XML document. So why? Why would this be good? Well, it come, it's derived from an international standard. It allows full identification and full documentation of, of a station. There is actually a security layer involved in sensor ML protocols and the OGC protocols. So you could encrypt this and decrypt it as necessary. The full description is very important because that's where we can log all the bloody metadata. The scheme is already developed for a uh, generic weather station, actually for two specific weather stations, and taking that to generic weather station and expanding is very straightforward. But it's chatty, and it's going to require something like GeoJSON to make it work. Why GeoJSON for a weather station? Well, National Mesonet actually now has uh, trucks, long-haul truckers with weather stations on them. Very much like the TAMDAR data that I talked about, well, we now have trucks that are driving through uh, thunderstorms and picking up data. Configuration's a pain. I hate writing schemas. They just drive me nuts. Most humans are not going to sit there and actually enter the data, so some sort of a configurator, probably a web-based tool, would be almost mandatory. And XML is almost never suited for radio especially not for questionable packet lengths. But GeoJSON is shorter and more compact and can be encoded and might work for that. Once again, I'm presenting this, I'm not locked on it. If we want to come up with something better, if we want to argue about it for a while and come back to the what is our first requirement, I'm good with that. But I've got more geeks in a room than I could get on a reasonable basis in other settings and I can ask these questions. Sir. What's Tamdar? Tamdar is a system that is now installed on most new Boeing and Airbus aircraft where the data, the, the flight level data and descent data are sent back to uh, IBM now, they own the company, and it provides barometric pressure temperature and humidity information, and then the flight data system also provides wind velocity and wind uh, direction. So this looks just an awful lot like when, I, when we launch a radius on balloon, it looks an awful lot like that, except it happens every time an airplane climbs out from the airport or uh, descends into the airport for landing. And if you go to some place like Minneapolis where the original flight tests for this uh, system were done, that's a lot of flights. That's a lot of granularity and temporal granularity in the data set. So I could watch minute by minute what the profile looked like as a frontal system moved in or snow moved in or something like that. It's, yeah, Bruce. So uh, I, I think we can come to a setting of what expectation should be. Uh, and I think the setting of expectation should be that uh, from your chosen format, where I think star FL seems to be what you like the most, um, the definition of data fields can very definitely be brought into radio. And having brought the definition of data fields into radio, 
Um, the actual format is pretty irrelevant. Okay. Uh, and you can mechanically translate very easily from one to the other. And thus, you know if it's a fixed length field or if it has byte long indices or, or if it's done in Java script object notation. It, it hardly matters as long as when it leaves the system, you can get star FL out of it. Okay. And for, for the record, I like star FL. I'm not sold on it being our only answer. That's, once again, there's a geek collection here. There's got to be more opinions than just mine. But aren't we at the point right now we need to know what the end user of the data needs? I mean, what all the temperatures, the humidity, but it goes, and then I hear you add on more and more. Because if it keeps adding on more, where do we end at? You know, we could... We don't. We the, don't, but oh, I guess I, I'm looking at from how do we then wrap this and packet that data up, because we have to know what formats. I was looking, glancing at the APRS document. They already have weather in there in raw format and positionalists, all that. Pragmatically, all there's really only one there. format routinely uh, reported. Okay. And that one has a position associated with it, and it has a strict format for temperature, pressure, humidity. Right. And that's and what you want to get away from. You want to expand those to add the precision, precision you need. Yeah. But, but yet APRS is going to have how, how much data do you send with each burst, and it's all wrapped up, and then eventually that internal data gets pulled out. And I'm wondering what's going to happen if we start changing things and somebody else is going to start crying because it's not going to meet their need. Oh, almost certainly. <laughs> <laughs> that I have yet to encounter any change where I don't hack somebody off. So, yeah. I, I see this as, as two major problems here to go to what Bruce said. We, we have a need to have an extensible means of adding new data sources at potentially new precision as time changes. And tagged data is a perfect format for that, it's, uh, whether it's XML or JSON, or there's many ways to do that. But, and, and knowing what you need and setting a standard for that is one part of that. But we also, talking about APRS, have the transport problem. And, Fundamentally, this, this is a question about how to transport uh, tagged variable format data using the APRS system. And I think that's the root of what we're going to come to at a discussion about the APRS standard. This is two discussions, actually, because APRS and how we continue to transport the data over RF is one of them. And whether we continue to use that protocol to get it into the various servers, or we actually create another server hierarchy that handles something else, is another. I uh, have one back here. Go ahead. I, so I'm horrible with attribution. It might have been Bruce yesterday that brought this up, but this is a little orthogonal, but it, the whole idea of a hybrid system that leverages different transports for different functions within the whole system seems, to, this seems to be laying right smack in the middle of that concept. And that would be to say the rich data, uh, whether it's, whatever it is, let's just call it the rich data can, can transcend a media that will support it, the internet, or a high bandwidth radio link, whatever that might be. Yet the temporal, small data that we want at a much more rapid rate, the measurement data itself, that's what we need to fit in a more, uh, a friendlier protocol, as opposed to say XML or what have you. And, and we want it to fit in the smallest bandwidth possible just because that's good efficiency, it's good engineering. And we don't necessarily need to have all that metadata with every packet that just says this is the temperature, right? Okay, so I'm just trying to say, for me it seems like we definitely need the scientist's input on the, the, the metrics that they require and it doesn't stop with land-based meteorology. I care about sea surface temperature and one of the things I'm doing. So it's just another field. But 
there's that data, but then there's also how do we bring the system together? It's a system architecture. And I would say that system could take one step above APRS as we know it today, because it could include, it could include this hybrid system that leverages the various transports to pass different different levels of richness and and frequency of data. That you know, just I'll have to look, but I believe just from staring at too many data sets, something on the order of eighty percent of our data already come in without ever touching RF. So we could do that. And the other nice thing about the concept behind sensor ML, and once again. Help me find something better. This is the one I know. It's not the answer necessarily. But it, it's the concept of, of inheritance. So you don't have to repeat all the metadata all the time. All I have to have is a station ID, a time, and if it hasn't changed, I don't have to have the position, but then I have to have the sensor readings with, with a, adequate and appropriate precision. And you know, if it's if I'm only getting temperature to single units and not getting any, any significant digits after the decimal place, why represent the decimal place? Because that's going to be implied based, based on the units. That goes back to the schema and how we do it. How we encode it, I'm looking for suggestions for somebody better than me. Um, if you have a uh, 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 an open-ended tagged uh, format then, the, s the schema exists separately. It's not enforced by the packet structure or anything like that. So you have an open-ended set of tags. What you really have to do is standardize the meaning of the tags uh, so that when someone spells temperature a certain way, you know it's, they're going to give it to you with a certain precision. Um, or something like that. And so what you really need is a definitive, a, a mechanism for s setting out definitive uh, tags. And then um, anyone who uh, wants to add tags to that can work their way through. Uh, if they want to get them standardized, they can, but they can use them themselves and everybody will just ignore them then. Yeah. And that... You, you bring up a pain, you, you had your painful BWE moment. I had a painful moment with an ocean observing and prediction project where I got a list of variables from everybody and I was doing the data management for all of this. And I had temperature. And over here I had temperature, but they, not only were they not in the same units, they weren't even the same temperature. And they were from two different flavors of the same model but the way they had represented their output was completely different. So yeah, we've, we've got to standardize on the tags absolutely positively on time. And that's going to be a whole other level of effort in itself to enforce that, at least initially. Once that's taken care of initially, most developers will pay attention to it if it's well documented. That's been my, my experience. But the, but the overall architecture is, independent, is separate of that. Yes. Yeah. Can we give you... Um a magic wand and say, give us your, your wish list. If given a magic wand, you know, don't worry about any constraints or whatever. What is it you would wish for? I can define that. Okay. I can define what the measurements I would like to see are and what the potential for additional measurements might be. I don't know if there's anything that is relevant, if it's we're already beyond this or not, a uh, couple of things that come to mind. Um, how many of you are familiar with the ARRL's Cabrillo format for reporting uh, law, uh, you know, contest logs? A couple of you, okay. And, and you know that the way that's set up is you send one line, there's a, the first word in the line tells you what the content is, and then after that there's some format for what the content is, and it's a simple thing like, what's your station call sign? The next one is like, where are you, and so on. And that's kind of your metadata, and you just transmit that once. Then you get down to the, the, the individual contacts, and each contact is its own line. And it, you know, it says QSO, and it's got time and date, and who you talk to, and what their grid square was, or whatever the requirements are. Um, 
Similarly, there's a, a, an instrumentation programming language called Skippy, SCPI, that works in a similar manner. You have several words that kind of define what you're doing, and then in the end, you finally ship out the parameter that, that you've measured. Could something like that happen where you don't have to can, uh, encapsulate a whole lot of information uh, or a whole bunch of different fields, but, but the lead header description on any given transmission would tell you what it is, and you got one parameter that you ship with that. And then you just ship those whenever you need them to get there. For instance, if your temperature data only changes once every five minutes, that's all the more often you ship it. If the wind data changes once an hour, I'm, I know this is nonsense, but just that's all the more often you ship it, and you get that. The identifying stuff at the front tells you Okay, here's, uh, uh, here's where it came from and you've got everything else. That sort of thing, an inheritance of previous observations, is an idea that has been thrown about in a number of places. OGC was one where we did that. I could introduce that at NOAA, and I can tell you that people's hair will catch on fire almost immediately. Because and I want to I caution, let's not engineer right. the solution here. That's right. Okay, it, it's like what I said earlier. He's the expert, or these are the experts. What is the data they're trying to collect? What is it? We, as engineers, need to understand why they need it and how they're going to use it. That's it. End of discussion for the moment. We document that. That is that magic wand we're going to hand them. We're not going to talk technology or formats or what the ARRL does or what APRS did in the past. We're not going to talk about those. Your point, Steve, is we need to define the problem. Yes. No, we need to understand the experts. The, the problem is fairly well defined in that we have a set of parameters that needs to be a larger set of parameters available, and the precision is not adequate for what is the norm today. That is the, that's the core problem. And a subset of that is we need to be able to make the uh, parameters that we are measuring extensible in the future in a, in a straightforward manner. So can I identify what Why we... Why extensible? Because Somebody is going, you, nobody in their right mind would add insulation, solar radiation, and soil temperature to a home weather station, right? Why not? Why not? Well, it's additional information, right? Yeah, but, that, but that's the thing. When, when this was envisioned, when, when, when we started, and I'm sorry, I am going back to the spec, nobody would have thought to put it there, and then the answer was, oh, go put it in the remarks. But the remarks are eaten up with what we've got. Uh, got okay, first. so for the engineers in the room, the reason why I ask why is so that we understand the reason why we're making it extensible. Mm -hmm. Not just because it's soil data, just because in the past they didn't know what to do. So understand why in some of these mechanics, but don't engineer the solution right now. But the simple answer is extensibility is future-proofing, so you don't have to reconvene. That is the why. Yes. You just answered the why. Yeah. Again. Nothing can be made astronaut-proof because astronauts are so ingenious. Go. So uh, I don't think you have to worry about it not being extensible. Uh, the, these guys are up to speed with the state of the art in software engineering, and we're never going to make anything not extensible again. <laughs> and um, I think what this group is more interested in is actually reaching a little farther than other people can reach right now. And you brought up some intriguing possibilities because uh, I, I live on a hillside and soil moisture is actually an important parameter to me because that hillside tends to move when the moisture gets far down enough. Uh, and uh, 
Lightning is another one like that. And as soon as you say lightning, I think, well, are we interested in strikes or are we interested in electrostatic field? And, and that is an area where an organization like Tapper can actually be of use because uh, this group did actually make a lightning sensor once. It's no longer... Uh, are all the parts available, but we still know how to make it, and we, we actually still sell part of it. I've got to ask, was it a field mill type sensor? No, no, and, and that's the next thing I was going to bring up. It was a broadband VLF receiver, and if you look on the Tupper website, it's still in the catalog, but we can't sell it. And um, the, the next question is, well, gee, how hard would it be today to measure the electrostatic field, and do we actually need a field mill, or are there various other ways to do that sensing? And I looked yesterday at the cost of a field mill, and at, at least the professional one was about $1,800, and I just thought to myself, you know, there is no reason that Tapper could make a reasonably good and long-lived one for $300. Uh, no reason Tapper could not do that. There are several DIY field mills available if you look far enough. Yeah, but the, the thing that Tapper does is, is they take a DIY design and productize it and exactly. make it something you can produce and buy. So, so that's a place that's, you know, I, I think this group would be excited by, well, what data are people interested in that we're not getting today. Um, where, yeah, it's true, many of these weather stations do not even measure insulation. And uh, there's quite a bit of, of uh, reporting of that just starting up now. Davis, in fact, does sell modules for soil moisture, soil temperature, and insulation, and leaf wetness. So yeah, the stuff's out there, you can get it. We're starting to run a little short of time, so I want to get on to the hardware piece of this, and I've got some good ideas, but uh, Steve, are we going to be able to get email addresses from folks so that I could, uh, or could we set up a web page? Could we, could we do a web page and start? And the answer is yes. So uh, what I'd like to do is we can take about the last five or ten minutes here. What I'd like to do is... In fact, I'll just make it right now, and you can think about it. But I want to call for a volunteer to lead this charge. Okay, so think about it. Don't everybody rush at me at once. Okay, so if you want to volunteer to champion this and help lead this effort, okay, uh, it's like I said yesterday, we need doers. So some famous person said, if you want to get anything done, give it to a busy person. Okay, so I want to select the most busiest person in this room because it'll get done. Okay? No, I'm, I'm not busy enough, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's, um, as Jerry said, we're 10 to 11 right now. Let's let him go for an hour here. Let's listen carefully to his problem statement, what it is he would like to create. And then let's take the last few minutes here. I'd like to have a volunteer, and then we'll... Uh, create a website, and we'll put some discipline to this, okay? I like it. So I'm going to launch into the hardware aspect primarily. There's software involved in this too of what I wanted to discuss with this, with this group as well. And that's, we've got a citizen weather observing network. Maybe it's time to do a citizen lightning observing program. Lightning detection has turned into big business. Lightning strikes are important. There's a lot of people who look at that in insurance. There's engineers who look at that. There are uh, weather prediction projects that are looking at it now. And there are really only two serious, hardcore major players in the commercial field, and they both want big bucks for it. Weissler runs the oldest, longest national lightning detection network, which has now gone international for that matter. But the U.S. portion of it is highly restricted, highly controlled, and very expensive. 
Earth Networks is a newer entry with the U.S. Public Lightning Network, which uh, suggests that the data might be available readily for a fee. Real-time data are expensive to obtain for anybody. The Weather Service has gotten some of it for free for testing, gets to pay for some of the others. But the lightning data are becoming important. You know, I guess everybody has figured when you see a thunderstorm and you see a lot of lightning, it's going to be pretty intense. The science supporting that has been sparse until recently. Now it's getting much more solid that, uh, that we know that if you've got a lot of hail, that contributes to a lot of lightning. So that's a separate indicator of big hail, which is an element of big thunderstorm, severe thunderstorm. So we got alternatives in the open source world. Blitzertongue comes to mind. Uh, Boltec has their own version of it. Neither of these really make their data widely available for research. Blitzertongue will make its data available for, uh, for uh, their own participants only. They would not even entertain the concept of making it available for university research in this country. Forget it, no way, not going to talk about it. Uh, they wouldn't make it available for the National Weather Service for forecasting uh, or for uh, real-time warnings as well, unless you want to just go to the website, look at the map, and go, you know, we've got one second delay, and this is getting really intense. I'm going to go ahead and start warning on this. So there's no way to actually plug it in as an algorithmic approach to improving our warning system. And we are improving the warning system. We've got new toys, new tools, new geospatial tools that are going to change the way you see warnings in the next five years. Be prepared. There's, some question, there's no question about the quality of the uh, NLDN data. And for that matter, the quality of the USPLN data is literally improving by the week as they refine their algorithms and improve their hardware. So CWAP started because APRS users were already sending data. We recognized the utility of the data, and, and Russ Chadwick said, let's pull it in, let's start utilizing it for NOAA. It's effectively crowdsourcing. Get lots of reports. If they all correlate, we've got to assume they're good, and that's what pragmatically happens, even if the ivory tower scientists sometimes say, eh, well, why do you trust this data? No offense, Bruce. Uh, but there's not too much metadata, and you know, the, the, the hardware, thus the accuracy, can be all over the map. It still turns out to be very useful data. But APRS occurred because of packet radio. Now, what we have is lots of SDR hardware and applications. I think I heard a little something about SDR be taking over the world yesterday. And I think that's probably right. You know, the face of the experimenter is changing. And I didn't steal this from you, Steve, but you're right. It's more code. It's less sheet metal. That, that's where the field mill op, uh, idea is going to hurt. I don't know how to bend sheet metal well. Uh, we have people who understand it. <laughs> I'm glad, because all I do is cut my fingers. Yes. What happens if we actually take the, it, instead of saying, let's see what packet radio has brought to us lately, what if we actually predefine a project and then start going down that path. So cloud to ground strikes, which is the low hanging fruit on this, or is where I think we probably would want to start. Primarily, 95%, that would be primarily, the strike is called a negative strike because of the uh, charge mechanism, the negative charge in the cloud actually proceeding down via step leaders. And we'll see the, uh, some of this in, uh, in a little more detail in a second. To uh, find a, a path to something that takes it to ground potential to the positive charge that's following the storm on the ground. Cloud to cloud has a different spectrum. Instead of being in the HF and, VL, uh, and uh, LF, VLF spectrum, and actually 10 kilohertz is a little low. You want a whole lot more spectrum to look at. We're talking about VHF to UHF in the cloud to cloud range. And the intracloud and sprite range is frequently up at SHF, some of the microwave frequencies. Turns out that 2.4 gig is a real nice place to listen for sprites. There's one you didn't mention, which is transient magnetic. We can indeed look at transient magnetic uh, field. The 
I'm, I'm not sure that's going to be quite as easy and low-hanging fruit. I'm, I'm think I think it, it, it might be. It is, but, but it's also much shorter range. Yes. And unless we're doing interferometry with that, we're going to have real trouble getting both direction and distance. On the other hand, if we're, if we're talking about looking at an RF solution and we have good GPS position and good GPS time, we should be able to do a time of arrival calculation that's pretty darned accurate, especially if four, five, six stations have heard it. So what causes lightning? Lightning requires ice. Without hail, you don't see much lightning. And the term grapple is mushy hail, is probably as good a way to put it. A lot of us are trying to get away from the term sleet and go to ice crystals. That's, well, grapple is what happens when hail descends, gets mushy, and then starts going back up and gets hard again. That's why hail is not perfectly round. It gets mushy, it takes on different uh, molecules, and then goes back up and refreezes. So for convection, a thunderstorm, it takes three elements. It takes moisture. You've got to have a moist environment. You've got to have an unstable environment where you can actually see the air lift and uh, change state as it goes up to altitude and gets colder. And then you've got to have the lift, which actually triggers that, updraft, that initial updraft to get the moisture up to where it's going to freeze. So you've got a couple of stages here. You've got the inflow into a towering cumulus. Those are the nice little puffy cue that you see that don't go very high up. They're the initial stage of what could turn into a very interesting thunderstorm or a devastating thunderstorm, depending on your outlook. Later in the cycle, you see inflow here going up. This is actually a mature storm. You can tell because it goes up to the, uh, a, a region called the tropopause and it shears at the tropopause with the change in winds. If it shoots through the tropopause, you know those thunderstorms you see that have that updraft, that little cone that goes up above the flat top? Those are very interesting. Those are very severe. Those I like watching. But I'm weird and that's my job. So what you have here represented is an updraft followed by a downdraft. You'll also see some entrainment in here where some of this moisture will be re-entrained in another updraft, usually not the same one. We used to think of it as a conveyor belt. We don't think of it as a conveyor belt now, but a series of different elevators. You get off one, you get on the other. You're going up or you're going down. As you go up, temperatures get very cold. As you come down, temperatures get warm, especially in a summertime or spring thunderstorm environment, they get warm enough to melt this stuff. Okay, so I'm going to speed through this because this is meteor. Yes? Uh, what's a sprite? A sprite is an upward lightning bolt, lightning strike, that actually exits the cloud and goes up towards space. And oh, by the way, it's a gamma ray emitter. We don't know the mechanism. These have been recorded, both the gamma ray uh, impulses have been recorded from satellites and from ISS, and the sprites have been uh, visually recorded from ISS. So somewhere in there we could hypothesize that there is a really strong electron beam. Oh yeah. <laughs> and what we have is we have ice, nucleation. I was in Boulder once, drinking beer with a bunch of buddies at one of the bars in downtown Boulder when a fight broke out next to us. It was a bunch of cloud physicists who couldn't agree on how nucleation occurred at the top of a cloud. I'm serious. It, they, they literally had a fist fight over how... I, I was listening to this as it got louder and louder, and they're, no, it happens this way. Well, it requires black carbon. No, it doesn't require black carbon. Dust will work. No, it doesn't. It's got to be an ice crystal. Yeah. These guys get passionate. <laughs> Nucleation occurs when a particle, I don't care what, encounters a molecule of water vapor and entrains it. And you begin to see the first inkling of a water droplet. Or in this case, at those heights, normally it's an ice crystal. It takes this supercooled water molecule of vapor 
and goes, ooh, now you have a surface to bind to and you're really cold. You're no longer a molecule. You're no longer a vapor. You're ice. These crystals accrete into larger crystalline forms and take on odd shapes. When they get too large, they start to fall because they've gotten to the point where they're no longer buoyant in the cloud and what, are, what resembles an updraft at that altitude. And they begin to create a downdraft phenomenon. And as they get warmer, they melt a little bit. And when they melt a little bit, they get smooshy on the outside, but they remain solid on the inside. And they encounter water, other water droplets, and they add on to them. When they encounter these water droplets, these collisions that lead to accretion of the, of the droplet onto the extant grapple are actually shears electrons out. So at the lower level of the cloud, you have a negative charge. And we'll see this represented graphically in a cartoon in just a second. And then you go, it, it re-enters a, uh, if it doesn't fall out the bottom of the uh, downdraft, it re-enters another updraft and uh, goes up to the level of what we call the level of free convection, the point where the buoyancy stops for the weight of the mass of the uh, particle that we're talking about here, and it'll wander around in limbo for a little bit, and then it'll begin to descend again, and you'll see this accretion, collision, and electron shearing process. So yeah, we start building up some very large charges around these clouds. And not all clouds are created equal. Some of these clouds, as you get up, especially once you penetrate the tropopause, that updraft, downdraft phenomenon continues to occur, but the updraft is very strong in the, po in the one that penetrates the tropopause, so it'll entrain new droplets going further up high. And those are the ones that, it, that tend to generate your sprites. They're the real tall 60,000-foot thunderstorms. Large droplets freeze at altitude, and the ones that survive and land as hail are the ones that are really the odd shapes. Everybody, everybody knows that hail is perfectly round, right? <laughs> if we see a picture and a report of three-inch hail that looks like a balloon, a, it was made in a water balloon, it probably, it probably was. <laughs> hail is ugly and spiky and pointy and all sorts of other things. It's almost never regular. Now, we, we have seen some fairly regular hail, but it came and buoyed around for a little while in lower, lower levels and then refroze and came down, and it smoothed itself out. But that, we can tell that by actually carving it, going cutting it, and taking a look at the, at the way it was put together, and you'll still see the spiky elements in there. Okay, so what we do is we effectively create a charged environment. We have charge separation in the cloud, and then we have a field on the ground that tends to follow the cloud. And that's what allows lightning to go from cloud to ground. It's trying to uh, equalize the field. So there's at least one channel from cloud to ground when you see a lightning strike for cloud to ground strikes. The negative channel starts to propagate from the base, and it's trying to find a way to the positive field on the ground. And what happens is you see these step leaders. You can't really perceive this with your eye because it happens too fast. But step leader is about a 50 meter path from the cloud, it takes about a microsecond to occur. And it's looking for a path to the ground. And you might see several uh, on high speed photography that will uh, become obvious. There's about a 50 microsecond pause and it goes, let's try this again. Now, it's a low energy charge that uh, affects this step leader, but it does ionize the uh, path, so it'll tend to come down the, the uh, short path that it's already started and begin to find another one. And it keeps going until it actually encounters a streamer from the ground where the charge uh, from the step leader has gotten close enough to attract the uh, positive charge, and somewhere 30 to 100 meters from the ground, you'll actually see the, the uh, path complete, and then it hits, you, you see the next step. The step leader potential connects to the ground, negative charge flows down the path very briefly, and then the return stroke. That's the big flash, bang, boom, that you're used to seeing 
is the return stroke. It's not, it's almost, you almost never see the step bleeders occur. If you do, you're either looking at, oh, million frame per second photography, and yes, we do have that, or you're looking at uh, something that's an anomalous uh, presentation of, of the step leader. It normally is not something you're going to physically see without augmentation. So after this, what happens if you've got a repeat strike? You know, everybody's seen a strike where you see the flash bang and then you see another one in the same, you see the, se the second flash in the same path. Well, you've got less energy, and that is a dart leader that comes back down, energizes the path again, and allows the charge to go uh, from ground to cloud back. And you're trying to equalize potential. It's lower energy, it's almost never as bright, almost never as loud with the boom, because it doesn't have to actually reionize all the gas around it. So, it's still using the same path, effectively. That doesn't mean it's going to the same point in the cloud, necessarily because the cloud's got this dispersed charge. The return stroke is ground to cloud. That's what you see, that's what you hear. But your eyeball can't do much with that, and it sees it as, ooh, I saw, the, saw it fall from the cloud. So stepping through this in cartoon fashion, you've got the step leader initiation here, as it continues down, it eventually comes to something like, oh, that tree is connected to the ground. We can go ahead and talk to the tree. We're going to complete the path right here, and then you see the return stroke. And this is an animation of, uh, of a uh, strike at high, high speed, uh, uh, using high-speed photography. You can see the stepped leaders and then you can eventually see the return stroke back to the cloud. That's what it really looks like if you can get enough frames per second. Yes, sir. When I was a kid, it always used to be worn. Lightning will strike out of the blue. So what's, so can you comment on that? Yes, it can strike out of the blue. How does that happen? Well, that charge, you may have an accumulated uh, surface charge that, that is out ahead of the storm, and sometimes you'll think you're out, you're not under the storm, but in fact, part of the anvil is over you. And what you're seeing is the, effectively a step leader from the charged element of the cloud that may be a little lower coming down to that charged element on the ground that's out under the anvil or a little ahead of the anvil. And it's, going, it's still going to the same fields. You know, the same fields are still interacting, but they just appear to be discontinuous to you. What distances are involved here? the blue sky? If you can see the thunderstorm 30 miles out, it's time to start thinking about going indoors. Wow. Yeah, we have a bunch of nice buzzwords for people. Turn around, don't drown. Anybody heard that one? When thunder roars, go indoors. If you can hear the thunder, you're too close. Is there a way to measure that charge on the ground prior to a strike? And yes. can you describe that method? Not adequately, but Bruce looks like he probably can. So uh, a static field mill, uh, and I am not a physicist, but then again, I'm pretty much nothing that you've seen me presenting papers on. <laughs> and um, a static field mill takes the electrostatic field in the air and chops it with a rotating sort of commutator, and thus from that makes something that's alternating that we can actually detect and measure. And so you need a mechanical uh, sort of X-shaped metal thing, and you need a motor to turn that. That all sounds pretty easy so far. And uh, you need a, a sensor that sits behind the chopper uh, and the sensor can be a solid state device of rather high impedance. And um, having that, we can measure a DC electrostatic field. That's the real key, is that it's DC. Uh, and that chopper actually gives us a sort of ground reference against it. Um, and I, I looked yesterday, and, and these things are certainly available for professionals and obsessed amateurs. 
And, um, but they're available at great expense and nothing I just described actually justifies the great expense. Because we can. So you're not a meteorologist. Why do you care? Well, we can detect, you know, how far did Spark Gap manage to get? Intercontinental? There's no reason we can't detect a high energy, million volt, 30,000 or 300,000 amp discharge with enough stations to figure out where it's located. And that gives us another data point. Yes, sir. Has, has anyone uh, tried uh, tomographic sorts of reconstructions uh, from multiple, you know, arrays of lots and lots of uh, observations of some sort of, of lightning strikes where you, you know, back tra back Not that I've found in literature, but that might be another, co uh, another keyword I need to search. Uh, the uh, Langmuir, Langmuir, Langmuir Labs in um, New Mexico, um, near Socorro, near the very yeah. large array, they did something like that, and they had data to, they used RF and, and VLF to detect the actual position of the strike um, with very many samples per second using time delay of arrival. Um, and I think they're still doing stuff like that. They have mm -hmm. a research laboratory on top of a, a mountain which they shoot rockets up to yes. measure it. So there is, there is that, but... Um, I don't know. The, uh, and then you have like the Blitzer Tongue TDOA network that's not like as resolute because this you could actually see the 3D path. You, it, that, that's doable, that's achievable with, and I'm actually thinking in terms of a stepwise process here where we start just by coming up with a tapper version of, of something similar to Blitzer Tongue but where the data are, are more readily available to the research community and, and the public sector. And by extension, if they go to the public sector, they're going to be available to the private sector, too. That's just the way it goes. But the idea is to get something that's freely available out there and doesn't cost a bazillion dollars to be able to utilize, because we've got amateur meteorologists, professional meteorologists who are not associated with the big companies who want to look at this data as well. But So we, we're looking at something that's imminently detectable in the first place, and TDOA is probably the easiest answer for us to incorporate here, in my mind. Uh, now you, you wanted a problem statement. The problem statement is I want to local, detect and localize lightning strikes in cloud-to-ground strikes initially, but in a three-phase process, we'd eventually look at the other uh, spectra and look at cloud-to-cloud -cloud and intra-cloud plus sprite. So, yeah, let's do the let's do the low hanging fruit, the one we that and the you know that might actually be cloud to cloud. That might be an interesting adjunct, but that's another story. Um, somewhere in the HF and to VLF spectrum, somewhere between about 10 kilohertz and oh, two to three megahertz, the, is the predominant range where cloud to ground strikes seem to uh, have their most in, uh, their highest intensity. So that's probably where we want to be looking. The question then becomes, can we find an area that has characteristic waveform for lightning or different types of lightning strikes in a particular spectral range that's a little smaller and a little easier to sample with low-cost hardware? So I wish Steve was here. He'd like seeing this. Uh, Greg Jurens, K5GJ, uh, sent these to me. This was during uh, some lightning strikes uh, while he was sitting in Austin. And if you look, it's centered at four megahertz, but if you look right down here, you see that baseline rise? Well, that was a lightning strike the ba as the baseline went up. And you could see, see things get very interesting right in here. You also see a little bit of a baseline rise at the same time somewhere out in here. So there's a variety of places where we could look for it. What's the best one to look? This is going to be a data analysis problem. It's something Nathaniel and I have been talking about already. You know, how do we take the IQ data and figure out what spectrum we need to look at? And then concentrate on that. 
And once again, you can see a slightly better refined version of this where you see some elevated baselines in different frequencies. There's a variety of ways we can go with this. What's the best spectrum to look at? So this is just a straw man. And we come back to, I'm, I've, I've sort of defined the problem. I've got some ideas because I've spent a lot of time looking at this and coming up with, with this. But you guys can tell me I am completely full of it, and we've got a better way to do it. And that is, first, identify the primary spectrum subset to look at. That means we're going to have to collect a large amount of IQ data during thunderstorms and actually see what we're going to, uh, going to find out of the spectrum, analyze that, say, you know, we can characterize the spectrum as being a good spot for lightning. If we see an elevated baseline suddenly, that's probably lightning. For that matter, what about identifying other things like the characteristics of the lightning waveforms and creating a catalog of different lightning waveforms? The reason for that is if we have a particular waveform that we can identify and it happens to fit within a catalog of say 1,000 or 10,000, we can do a quick analysis, a quick pattern match locally and have the Raspberry Pi or whatever we use, whatever the solution for the computational engine is, send time, station ID, and catalog ID back to a central server and not have to do all of the uh, triangulation or trilateration on, uh, on the storm itself. How far does this lightning signal reliably propagate? The literature is all over the place on this. I've seen literature that says if you're not within 100 kilometers, you will not ever hear a lightning strike. Radio or? Yes, on, on radio. I think every hand can say if you're sitting there in the northeast and yeah. 80 meters is crackling, it's a storm down in Arizona or New Mexico. Right. So I think we can probably come up with a better answer than you've got to be really close. There's other literature that says 1,000 kilometers. There's some that says 3,000 kilometers. I don't think that community has ever studied it rigorously from the RF perspective of communicators and people in radio like this group is. That might be an interesting element just by itself, and it's certainly going to be publishable. How many stations do we need for CONUS coverage at the, at, at, to start with? Three is not enough. I can tell you that because we won't localize very well. The geometry is not always going to be decent. 10, 20, 50, 100. In quietly talking to CWAP stations over the last three, four, or five years, I've gotten at least indications of interest, if the price point's right, by upwards of 100 people. So we could probably get a pretty reasonable start, although just like everything else APRS, this tends to be clustered in population centers. Won't be necessarily ideal, but I bet we get enough dispersion to make it work. Timing? Well, so if we have GPS with 10 hertz uh, outputs for uh, either raw data or NEMA timing, we ought to be able to have adequate timing to uh, localize the stuff. Location? GPS again. Even using L1, if I have enough samples that are not autocorrelated, in other words, not consecutive samples, I can do an average and come in, oh, within easily a meter of horizontal location and about two and a half meters of vertical location. That's pretty reasonable, but it's long, long, long term. So time of detection to a site. Characterized waveform by lookup, and I don't know the answer to this either. Would, are we talking about doing an FFT, a wavelet transformation, what are we going to do to actually create the catalog and look up the waveform? There are a variety of ways to get there. I don't care what the final solution is, as long as we end up with either A, there is a solution, or B, we can't come up with a catalog that's meaningful. Yeah. Site location, we've got to know where that is to, look, to localize it, because if we have at least three sites seeing a similar waveform at about the same time, we can figure out through simple triangulation, trilateration methods, what, the, what a circular error of probability is for the location of that strike. If you add a fourth site, 
and you begin over-determining the fix, then you can do a least squares adjustment and tighten that up. Add five, and you over-determine it again. This is, we're talking about a 2D position, so you're never going to do more than three sites re, uh, reasonably to, uh, if you want to speed up the calculation. And this would occur at the server level. So you, you would uh, you, you say, I, I know what the speed of, propagation of the speed of light is, although, well, we no longer are so sure of that now, are we, after yesterday's presentation? Uh, but we'll make an assumption about that. GPS already makes assumptions about the speed of light and, and simplifies uh, the, uh, that velocity in its calculations. So why, I guess we could do about the same thing. We could even use their number. Um, the, uh, and then, but if you start over-determining, do multiple three-station fixes, and then do a least squares adjustment on that, you can get a very tight uh, CEP. So that's the recursive trilateration uh, approach to this. A network of servers, pretty similar to what we're doing with CWAP, except these are going to all be required to do a little more processing. They're not just going to be passing data upstream and re uh, retaining data in a queue. They'd actually have to do the trilateration and attempt, and attempt to do the resolution. And each server that received all the data would be expected to do that so that uh, you have common databases for uh, redundancy and backup. Station metadata, well, we're going to have to get that, but that only needs to be sent once with the possible exception of updating the location on a daily basis so that you can improve the accuracy of the location. Ooh, isn't that special? I thought I had fixed all those. You remember the uh, yesterday someone was saying that these slides have been back and forth between LibreOffice and PowerPoint too often? Guess what? So this is where I was talking about effectively the same sort of thing, uh, what the server has to do. It's got to actually, it doesn't need, the, the stations have to do the wavelet uh, or FFT or other analysis to come up with how we're going to fit the catalog match. And then they send that catalog ID, the time, and the station ID, and the rest is magic that occurs at the server level. The server actually shares the report with other servers immediately. All of the servers work on the solution because one server may fail in the middle of the solution. So if we just say, oh, you take this one? Nah. Let's let them all do it. It's not a heavy weight calculation. Even the least squares adjustment isn't. And then you calculate the ellipse, uh, the circ or the ellip uh, elliptical error of probability is actually more accurate than the CEP. And you refi refine that with the uh, least squares adjustment. For, uh, that's the multiple solutions aspect. And then you archive it. Send it to Matus. Well, I'll have to go through an argument with them about, no, we don't want more data. Yes, you do want more data. But I know the guys to talk to who can talk to their guys and convince them they really want it. Database backup on the servers. Why? Because I work for the government. I don't always trust the people I work with. <laughs> this data will almost certainly go into NCEI as soon as it's recognized as useful. Once we're confident that it goes there, we may not want to retain long-term backups, but we ought to have a couple of months or a couple of years and even some very interesting cases. I would desperately love to have Hurricane Harvey data, excuse me, uh, def of uh, the Houston area because the lightning strikes were intense down there and the tornado potential was really high. Uh, same thing for the Tampa Bay area. Tampa Bay, the, the uh, Newport Ritchie WFO issued more tornado warnings in 12 hours than had ever been issued for a 24-hour period throughout the entire state of Florida. There was probably a little lightning involved in, in some of that. That's just a guess, but those bands probably had some lightning because they did see hail. But to make the data available for research, having these freely available from us might be a good way to go, and then they can also request them from NCEI. The format that we keep them in may not be identical to the format NCEI keeps them in, and some researchers may actually like one format over the other. And then the server would, on a daily basis, 
keep averaging the position of the, these stations as they report with their GPS location simply because it can. I could go in, we had a, I had a discussion with someone yesterday about why decimating the data and not taking a continuous autocorrelated data set of, of L1 positions is important. But, and it's counterintuitive, but in fact it's exceedingly important to not use autocorrelated data to get your, your sole position and to not average your autocorrelated data over a long period of time. Your error, of, uh, your error ellipse actually becomes significantly larger. I've brainstormed this in a vacuum. I've talked to a couple of the folks I work with on a regular basis who are lightning experts. I am not a lightning expert. At this point, I am a reasonably well-informed amateur. I've got some engineering background and ideas and concepts, but there's a much larger suite of information, experience, and tools in this room than I could ever approximate. TDOA detection is a valid concept. GPS timing would provide us with the resolution to do that. But what am I missing? You know, what's missing? What have I overcomplicated? What is impractical? What's broken? Yes, sir? Has anyone done any investigation into measuring the flow measuring the flow of the charge in the ground to get directions? That's a good question for me to ask Don McGorman when I get back tomorrow. He would know if anyone does. I literally work with a couple of the most published lightning experts in the nation. I can walk down the hall after he comes wandering in at the crack of noon and, and ask him that question. Hey, he's been there 45 years. If he wants to come in at noon, he can come in at, 45, in, at noon. It's... So, data capture, characterization of signatures, what hardware is required to accomplish this? I'm thinking we can do this with SDR. What SDR platform? I'm not. Yes, sir? What kind of time precision requirements are you thinking about? I'd like to see uh, sub-second. Oh. Yeah. Okay. That's why I want to use GPS time with a 10 hertz output. Well, that may be a little bit more challenging because getting 10 hertz directly from GPS is usually not in the hardware we have available. GPS DO can do that. Mm -hmm. Easily, we could give you much, much better than a second. I thought you were asking about microseconds. Oh God, no. We can still do better than that. Yeah. The, this, yeah, t the, the 10 hertz output is, yeah, it is available in the inexpensive GPS market. One hertz output would probably be adequate. Sub second would be better. And the, the real question becomes, do you use NEMA timing or do you use, uh, use the raw binary timing? Because there are frequently delays in the uh, GPS hardware for NEMA. I, I think you want, you don't want either, you want pulse per second. Yeah, right. most of the GPS modules can provide that. Yeah, pulse per second would be one way to go, but we actually have to have a real time stamp on there. Yeah. And we can do that with, you know, with pulse per second, yeah, we could do that. Just for, for reference, I just put together a couple of NTP servers using a GPS hat on a Pi 2, and for a total investment of about 80 bucks, uh, I ended up, you know, with a few microsecond precision, uh, the, the GPS receiver has built-in antenna, has pulse per second uh, available, and the Pi could, could put the pulse per second on one of the GPIO pins, and, and it was there. So it's, it's very easy to accomplish mm -hmm. that. The, the, the PPS is going to be much better than trying to use either binary or... Okay. So that's, that, that, that is a potential solution to plug into this mix. And I'm, once again, I'm not trying to come up with all the solutions today. I'm trying to throw the problem out there and make sure everybody understands what the problem is. And then I'll participate in the solution, but I'm not going to be, I'm probably not a good enough engineer to come up with a solution. Oh, if I don't say that in this group. <laughs> <laughs> if, if we're going to develop a, a potential solution on an SDR platform, which I think your idea is pretty cool. Do you feel that we're going to need some secondary or, or a primary source of ground truth data to support that research? 
whether it's an existing commercial lightning detection network or some of the other methodologies that we do, that we could build, or some, in other words, for, uh, it could even be a photo detector, you know, something that confirms that the thing we just saw on our SDR was tied to an actual ground truth event in some proximity to where we are, something like that. Data collection for the initial characterization of lightning should be done with local storms and a single local receiver. But it should be done by multiple receivers and multiple people involved. That's at least my theory. So if I'm in Norman, Oklahoma, and I'm seeing a bunch of thunderstorms, and I actually start collecting and recording IQ data, then I can start characterizing that. I can run it through and filter it. And from there, we can begin the characterization. We can start comparing different waveforms from different sites. But that would provide effectively the ground truth, because I know I have a lightning-rich storm, and I'm collecting data, and they're all consistent with the raised baseline high energy uh, discharge. Would that be good enough in your mind? I don't know. I, I mean, I, I don't know what the, uh, what the error bars look like on that relative to it, when you start talking about precision timing and things like that. Well, the reason for precision timing is if we make the assumption that we are seeing a high energy discharge, a spark gap, then if we, we need to know when we heard it. When did, when did we actually see this? Because it's going to be at some point out there, I don't know where, but we have to know when we saw it uh, and when you saw it and when you saw it and they're all the same waveform, okay, fine. Then we can start drawing that ellipse. So. Uh, I think there's like three different people back here who got some things to say, but uh, you know, the, most of what we do with, with meteorology is to look at what happened and use that to kind of predict what's going to happen. And, and hopefully this lightning detection is the same sort of thing, but do we know enough about the mechanics of, and the timing of what leads up to a lightning stroke that, that there's a capability to predict where it might be? I have two people at the lab who are working on model prediction of lightning. The w official weather service pr uh, position is that we have no way of doing that granularity of prediction, knowing when it's going to occur, where it's going to occur. But there are two solid cloud physicists in my group that are working on this explicitly. And it's a hard problem. We can actually do lightning simulations now that will give us the probability for a region of lightning strike, but it's not, it, the, the spatial uh, granularity is not good and the temporal granularity is not, you know, it's not with, it's, it's, it's gonna happen within this 15 minute period, not this three minute period. Uh, Bruce. Hi there. Um, Hi. So uh, this is actually about the slide that you just put up. So maybe we're getting a little ahead. But my suggestion is, first of all, you probably don't have to worry about that. Second, the way that you are actually doing it currently is a little backwards. Um, what happens is when a company makes a disclosure into how they do things, especially when they make that disclosure before they file a patent, that that disclosure actually starts a clock. And once that clock runs out, which I believe is 21 years now, that um, that technology is, is simply not patentable unless they filed for an extension and received it. Well, if they and file for an extension, they filed for an extension because they improved the invention and there's a new claim. And, and that is actually this, what is valid at that point. And I, I know where you're going. Yeah. I, we need to have this as a later discussion because it gets really involved. But I know of two patent lawsuits recently filed that are the basis for my decision to clean room this thing as much as possible. 
Okay. And it, 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 they had, you, I agree with you. The problem is we are in violent agreement. Well, also, I am currently the uh, victim of a lawsuit with no motivation other than to bully me, where the people who filed it either were really clueless or knew they would lose. And that is very often the kind of suit that we're talking about. It's, it's simply, hey, they're a little guy and they can't defend themselves, so let's intimidate them and everybody in their field. That was one of the suits that I am referring to, and it went to appeal, was remanded to the original trial court. The trial court told the appeal court, appeals court, I'm not going to hear this again. I've already heard it. I've already ruled. Your appeal is based on political motivation. Go find another judge. The other judge said, oh, yeah, sure, I agree with all these claims that you've now modified and have no bearing at all on what the original uh, trial said. Um, not all patent cases and not all federal district cases are necessarily based on an apolitical environment. And the companies that are involved in this have already demonstrated their ability to contribute to political campaigns at a level that I don't want to think about. Um, uh, there's one that was in, in East Texas. There was one that was in the Huntsville, Alabama region. Uh, yeah, we've got one back here, John. Hang, hang on a second. Um, w one thing not legalistic that I wanted to point out was that... Good. Uh, the, um, I've recently seen, and I can't say where, I can't remember where, uh, some interesting work, if you're wanting to characterize and classify the, uh, the lightning strikes, uh, I've seen some stuff using uh, learning out, learn, stacks of learning uh, tools and TensorFlow, things like that, uh, for RF moduli identifying RF modulations. Cool. And uh, the, claiming something like 85% accuracy or something. That, okay, that sounds like a solution that we need to document. Okay. And not, yeah, that, that, that's the sort of thing where I love hearing it, but I'm not going to say, oh yeah, let's go that path. Yeah. That, because we, we, we have the brain trust in here and the, the greater brain trust that's not even made it to the meeting that might find this interesting and get involved. I like the idea. Right now, I'm on a machine learning kick. I think anything associated with machine learning is way cool. But it may not be the most practical answer. Certainly not real time. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, but it may be for research. Yes, sir. I, uh, I live out uh, large plains. I have a large view of the horizon. I'm just wondering, would there be any value in having video recordings as well as RF recordings that are tied back together? There would be benefit. There might not be a mandate for that after we do the characterizations. But yeah, for the, for the characterizations, I, could see, I, can, I can see a benefit. By the same token, if you have the type of thunderstorms I get in Oklahoma, I can just close, turn off the lights and leave the computer monitor on and see the flash and know that that, that, that waveform was associated with a lightning strike. And John, you had a... And this is not legal advice, uh, and I'm not giving legal advice, and I don't have malpractice insurance, so don't bother me suing, uh, suing me. Uh, but there is probably a way through the magic of open source and wide distribution to essentially end up with such a distributed body of potential defendants that it's impractical to create a choke point through litigation. I am hoping that, but I'm paranoid. And it's As well they you are should to, be. Yes, they are out to get me. Uh, what I want to do is create an environment where they come and demand to see my computer records and my notebooks, and I'll be glad to give them both of them, and they'll never find a single document that is tied to their information. Because I can go talk to the experts and read the texts, and I can get the information that they probably worked off of in the first place. And in, in one case, Visola within LDN, I will get the letter, and then I'll get a phone call from one of the guys that I know personally who will say, why are you doing this? Here's why. How did you get into it? 
these books and Don McGorman and, you know, and Kristen Calhoun and et cetera, et cetera. And it's like, okay, I'll call off the dogs. <coughs> so that one I'm not particularly worried about. Um, some of the other companies that are starting to play in this game, including Earth Networks, are still looking at recent legal settlements in the meteorological community going free of money. That, that is my concern. So yeah, I'm a little paranoid. No, I don't think it's going to be a serious problem, and I agree with you that the open source environment with too many people to sue would probably create a problem. Let's go ask SCO how that turned out. So, I just wanted to make sure people were aware of this. I've done this so far in as close to a clean room environment as I possibly can. Unfortunately, simply looking at the displays and looking at the physical hardware in the field tells me an awful lot about how this stuff works. Going back a couple of slides, you don't need to go back, but the second step was the data, uh, the, the character, uh, characterization of the waveform. And we heard a presentation this weekend about recording uh, solar events for a very long duration, generating massive amounts of data. I can see this also generating massive amounts of data until the characterization is done. Are we, are we creating a massive mail drop problem to move this data around until we can actually filter it effectively? Nathaniel had a site hosted by CERN, I've got it written down but not readily available, that can allow uh, large file storage. Yeah, but getting it there, how do we get it there? Well, I, th I think what you end up having to do is having all of you're going to, you're going to need to have intelligence in the local node so that once something happens that it recognizes important, it saves that chunk of data and uploads it. And it may take it three days to upload that event, but it throws away the uninteresting data if uh, we can at some point. If we can identify a method to begin the characterization, we can do the pre-processing Im immediately on the local node after the event. You know, thunderstorms, with, with the exception of, oh, Hurricane Harvey that lasted for five days in the Houston area, thunderstorms tend to be a very short event. They roll in, they roll through, they roll out. So you collect data for an hour or two hours or four hours, and then you've got the next week where you're not worrying about collecting data. So it, it, that might be a possibility. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I do not work for Flex Radio, but I own them. And Steve, if Steve were here, he could speak for himself. I've talked to Steve and Gerald about these topics. They're interested in contributing to citizen science type observations. The radio has very broadband capabilities. It has IQ capabilities. And it has an option for a very high precision uh, GPS that can be used for time of arrival. So uh, integrating a package like that with a, a vendor that has the capabilities to support it could produce any number of interesting da data sources that might be used. Now, Flex is high on my list, for, yeah, and I had talked to Greg when he worked at Flex, and I haven't talked to Steve about this for a while, but that's, that, that's high on my list for getting the data to characterize. Um, the price point is going to be a little prohibitive if we have to put 6,000 series radios at each huh. site. And, and are people going to want to leave those radios turned on and connected to an antenna when the thunderstorms? Well, the antenna that you, I, I leave my uh, USRP-1 connected to an antenna all the time, but my antenna is a little different from the antenna that normal humans, well, we're hams, that hams would normally want to leave connected. Question back here. Um, so on that note of, you know, having to deal with all the expensive flex radios, some of the work I did, I didn't do any, like, official research, but kind of back of the napkin calculations to see if it was feasible. When I worked at the Very Large Array, it's a public facility, public radio observatory, and people would come in with cell phones and Wi-Fi access points. My job as an intern was to tell them to all turn their phones off, so I was getting sick of going around the, this um, large area, and I was thinking from an RTL-SDR perspective. Uh, what could I do to um, trilaterate cell phones based on like just the wideband data burst that I can see 
you know, you know, cell phone spectrum is like 20, 30, 40 megahertz, but all I need to see is a sudden burst or a sudden rise in the amplitude. Um, and you can apply this directly to um, lightning detection because it's just a wideband burst and um, apply a RF down converter to a RTLSDR, take a wideband FFT and look for, you know, sudden lurges in the rate or sudden rate of change in the average of the, of the amplitude. There's a lot of delay in the processing of the RTLSDR. I think that can be characterized. Um, they're obviously not GPS disciplined, and, and so some of the stuff I did was like seeing, oh, is it feasible to find what building is, you know, their collection of radio sources coming out of? But um, and there's been kind of not development, but but spurts of growth in that in that field or of 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 thought. Not really any anybody doing anything about it. Um, um, but I think that's really cool aspect of using the uh, RTL SDRs and really low cost SDRs, um, you know, to, to get away from the politics and actually do something really cheaply within, you know, not within a like a vacuum and doing it with Tapper. Um, so as there's just some thoughts there. Well, and what you're, what you're suggesting is a goal statement. So I'm going to step in. It's 10 minutes till mm -hmm. noon. Okay. And do a little facilitating here. Um, What we need is a very good and clear as daylight. There's a really good book, and it's called Scrappy Project Management. The book is a very thin book, but the author speaks about 12 different things that has to happen in a project. And it, and it basically, she has done so much project management that if these 12 things don't happen, then the project's going to fail. Okay, so they're just irrefutable 12 steps. One of those is a clear as daylight goal so that we can all know where to point our nose and go to. Okay? Now, I mentioned earlier, about an hour ago, I said I'd like to get a volunteer to champion this. We need a doer. Anybody here brave enough to raise their hand now? Okay. Okay, so David? Possibly, I don't entirely know what's in, in what I'm signing up for. <laughs> well, and, okay, so, so Dave, what, what I'll do is, I do a lot of facilitating, uh -huh. okay? And I do a lot of, um, a lot of leadership mentoring as well. So I'd be happy to help you with okay. that on what you need to do. All okay. right. John Ackerman. I'll be happy to be part of a, oops, just, I'll be happy to be part of a team because I think I can help with the timing stuff. I've, I've got some well, well, bigger hold on, picture hold ideas. On well, so I just hold on. volunteering to help. Okay, but we need to fo I'll volunteer for a champion. That's David. Not a, okay. Because I'm not asking yeah. for. I will, I will. Join David's team. You will, as a Ad, advisor, flunky. designer, flunky. flunky. Okay, so you're a flunky. Okay, you're you're low as well. Shit, at okay. this point. So hang on. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we need a champion. Okay, so Dave's treading on thin ice. He's a big guy. So you're going where. Few are willing to tread, but we're all gonna love you for it. Okay, <laughs> you're you're gonna get lots and lots of love. All right, so I'll help you with that, Dave. So if for all for all those that are here, this is Dave Witten. No relationship to Mel Witten. Okay. All right. He's really a rocket scientist, but he doesn't admit it. He's a smart guy. No, I, I, I believe. Now, taking a leadership position is a lot different than being a smart guy and, and solving a solution. However, in solving that solution, you go through steps, okay? And this is where I've been interjecting throughout Jerry's talk. There are clear steps that need to be taken, and we're all very excited, and we all are contributing our, our little pieces to this puzzle, and we're all wanting to jump in and, and give our little spiel. And I want to caution, it's like, wait a minute, slow down, stop, just for a moment, just hit the pause button, we're not telling you to, to, to stop, 
just hit the pause button. Absolute first step is to understand the data that the meteorologists need, okay? And it's like I said earlier, it's just the data. We're not gonna talk solutions, we're not gonna talk how we're gonna transport it. What is the data? So that's step one, okay? Then we wanna know why and how they're going to use it. We as the problem solvers then go, oh, okay, that's, that's why it needs to be at this decimal point. It's like the rhetorical question I asked, why does it need to be extensible? Because we just don't know what the future is. Now we start documenting requirements. Now, Jerry's very, in, he's very experienced at writing specifications, okay? So we'll lean on him for the, the information that he needs, but we first step is to document just what the information is, right? Mm-hmm. Hey, don't we have two different projects here? Yes, there are two. There are two. Well, go ahead. Okay. You, the, the first one, the uh, metadata and uh, data transport was sort of a, I, I need advice, how do we go? And that could be another Tapper project because I think w with the ties to APRS and the, and the basis for CWAP originally, it's a very good fit. And then you've got the Lightning project. They could become two, uh, they could mold into one overarching, we're going to do meteorology for a while, but we've got these two subsets. Uh, I think that's going to be a little bit of a stretch. I think you're going to find people who want to do the lightning, and you're probably going to find more of them than you find who are going to want to look at the uh, software and transport. Right, and the data format mm -hmm. to, to do that. So there is two projects. Thanks, John, for identifying that. Um, David, you're signing up for which one of those two? Um. <laughs> Choose carefully. Well, I, uh, Which is the one that interests you? It has to interest you. You have to have passion. Let me be absolutely clear about what, what the choices were again. Uh, the, the, because data I made, format? Data format. Or making a lightning detector. Okay. Um, I would, to me, the, the bigger problem is having a, a format to put the data in. So, okay. And so the data format, though a little less sexy and more. Okay, no. Is probably the, the more important here's problem. the key about being a volunteer. Uh -huh. And this is what makes a volunteer do what they do. You have to have an interest in it, it you have to be passionate in it. If you don't have those two, please don't volunteer. Uh -huh. And I'm not telling that just to Dave. I'm telling that to all of you. No, I can. Uh, okay. So, are you willing to take on the data format? Yes. Problem. Okay. So we Ooh. got that. So we still need a champion for leading. Okay. So you'll take that. And I know it's Cecil, but I always Paul. Uh, the thing about Cecil is I have an uncle Cecil, and that's his first name. And you got like two first names. <laughs> all right. So Paul Cecil. So thank you. And then I'll work with both of you yep. on that. Okay. Both of you need to come up with a very clo clear goal statement so we make sure that everybody knows where the pointy end of the ship is and which direction we're going. That way that helps steer the whole ship. Then let's make sure we do clear research of what has been done. Let's make a clear understanding about what is to be collected do no engineering, okay? Don't even try to solve it, just collect it. Now, what we need to do too is, um, I want you guys to have as frequently a meetings as you need to and form your teams, okay? Have weekly, monthly phone calls, okay? Document it. And then we'll have to find places to basically, so the academic way of doing this, the IEEE way of doing this is they, they very strongly document this, all of these decisions, why you chose the things that you did are documented. So 
make sure you, you document the whys behind it so that people can read the past and go, oh, okay, that's why they did that. Okay, here's the decision, here are our choices, here's the one we selected, here's why. Okay, so that's just a little broad brush painting just to get started. And then let's see those research papers at the next DCC. Okay. Um, we have not set what the next DCC's Sunday seminar is. Could it be this again? Could it be the results of, of this again? So those are rhetorical questions. In other words, the DCC for 2018 hasn't been written yet. You guys are the authors. Okay? It's a convention bring an update and see where we're at right. inside DCC. Absolutely. So what, here's, here's the first six months right. milestone is make a report at Dayton Hamvention. That report's going to be giving a 10 to 15 to 20 minute talk at the, the forums on Friday morning. Okay? And whatever displays you want to put at the booth, you have, you have a space. Okay? Is that pretty clear? It, all right. So I see this as a crowdfunded, this is, this is, how many are, are familiar with local motors? Have you ever heard of the place called local motors? Take a look at them on the internet. They literally crowdsource and designed an automobile. Okay? This is crowdsourcing. This is, an, uh, this is how we're going to have fun doing this. Now, for those of you that are in the audience and on YouTube, is now you know the names of these two gentlemen, and if you want to join up with them, whatever is interest you and you have a passion for, two key elements, get with these gentlemen, and then start working with them. And then, of course, these two gentlemen, you're going to have to go out and reach out to other people as well, okay? So that's part of the leadership aspect. All right, so for the audience here, what have I missed for these two gentlemen? Did I cover it? Okay. Do you will you support these two gentlemen? May I hear a aye? Aye. Okay. Any opposed? Good. All right. Thank you very much. Um, One very quick question: Is there a tapper place for this? A repository? So is there a repository? We can make one. The answer is yes. We have a GitHub. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Get. In other words, this is great. We're in the 21st century. Let's use 21st century tools, right? What a novel idea. Yeah, it is. I mean, gosh, we don't want to be, come across as old farts, do we? <laughs> Excuse me, I resemble that remark. Okay, definitely. All right, so let's see. What do you think? Was this a good Sunday seminar? Thank you. And in my backpack, I have a plaque for you <laughs> that okay. says thank you. So I want to shake your hand on camera. And any final questions? Any final wrap-ups? And that's a wrap for Sunday. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you again next year. Thanks, everybody. So that's pretty cool. They just made up a project on the spot. And you could have a part. Now, I need to admit that I have not done any follow-up since the project. And as I was editing it and getting there toward the end, I realized we need some contact information. So I've asked the guys to supply it. I don't have it yet to talk to you about here as I record this video. So what we will do is uh, put a little section on the hamradionow.tv website for this episode uh, 373. And it will contain links to all the contact information that you will need if you want to take part in this. So stop by the website. Might not appear immediately if you're watching this, like right away. I'm going to wait for them to fill me in and, and get, get me updated on what's going on. But, uh, but that will be the place to go and find out uh, what's happening with this project and how you might be able to play. Ham Radio Now brought to you by you. Stop by the website, hamradionow.tv. Click on the pig. That is Arvin. He's our chief financial officer. He's in charge of all the money and help us out. No Kickstarter supported this um, uh, round of the uh, DCC. So your contributions are doing it all. 
And uh, that is it. Uh, I, I, time to stop talking. I'm Gary Pierce, scan 4 aq 73, over and out. Box on the table on your way out, and we reuse the badge holders.